wondering why on earth would I make a theory video about the Purple Wedding, an event that happened all the way back in A Storm of Swords. What more can possibly be said? Clearly Littlefinger and Olena Tyrell poisoned Joffrey's wine. After all, Littlefinger told us, case closed. But is it case closed? How do we really know that the Queen of Thorns and Littlefinger killed Joffrey? Let's remember that Littlefinger is perhaps the biggest liar of our story. Can he really be trusted? And does his explanation even make a lick of sense? Well, let's go back and examine this cold case. Let's start our analysis by asking if Joffrey actually died by poison. Couldn't it be possible that Joffrey simply choked? After all, George R. Martin himself said he wanted the incident to be ambiguous in this regard. And people at the wedding seem to assume Joffrey choked until Cersei accused Tyrion. So is it possible that he choked? Well, I will say that two different maesters did examine Joffrey and found no food in his throat. Or so they claim. Can these maesters be trusted? Well, one maester is Maester Balabar, the red wine maester, and the other maester is Maester Franken, the Stokeworth maester. Now, it is true that the red wines and the Tyrells are close. In fact, Olena Tyrell is a red wine. And so perhaps there's an outside chance that Olena saw an opportunity to get rid of Tyrion after the choking and told Balabar to lie. Though I'm not quite sure what the motive would be. Sansa has already fled, so there's no marriage opportunities with her. I can't think of any other reason why the Queen of Thorns or the Red Wines would want to target Tyrion. Additionally, even if the Red Wine Maester were lying, we're still stuck with Maester Franken, the Stokeworth Maester, and he has no connections to anyone that we know of. Yes, I suppose he has red hair and one could argue that he's a secret red wine or something, but lots of people have red hair, so that's a pretty big jump. At the end of the day, we have no reason not to believe Balabar and Franken. Unless the pie somehow dislodged or Joffrey had some other food allergy, we really have to accept these maesters' professional opinion. Joffrey was in fact poisoned. But hold on, just because there was a poisoning at the wedding, doesn't necessarily mean Joffrey was the target. We know from our adventures with honeyed locusts over in Marine that people can consume poison meant for other people. Now, I would actually argue that Strong Belwas actually ate honeyed locusts meant for him. In fact, I did a whole video on this. But everyone else seems to think the target was Danny. In the end, the point is the same. People can easily consume poison directed at others by accident. So, how do we know that Joffrey was the target? Well, we kind of don't. I'll grant, on first read, Littlefinger appears to know quite a bit about the events of the wedding, making it look like everything went according to his plan. But let's step back and truly examine exactly what Littlefinger knows. At the time of Sansa's escape, Dantos and Sansa know pretty well the details surrounding Joffrey's poisoning. And Sansa goes straight to the godswood, gets changed, and then meets up with Dantos. The two then climb down a cliff to meet Oswell Kettleblack, who rows them out to Littlefinger on his ship. Now I suppose there's an outside chance that one of the Kettleblack brothers went to update his father before Dantos and Sansa got there, but climbing down and up that cliff seems like quite a bit of an obstacle. So Sansa, Oswell, and Dantos make it to the ship, and Dantos is killed before he can really report on anything. So, assuming Oswell didn't get informed, Sansa really is the only one who knows the details of what happened at the feast. And then Littlefinger says, your disappearance will make them suspect you and Joffrey's death. Now, if we aren't careful, we may think that this implicates Littlefinger. He knows Joffrey is dead, therefore he must have planned it. But let's also remember that the bells are ringing and sound travels across the bay. Littlefinger may know Joffrey is dead, but he could have easily figured that out by hearing the bells. Littlefinger then asks Sansa to tell him about the feast. Littlefinger seems to know that it was Cersei who planned the feast and about some of the attractions. Singers, jugglers, a dancing bear. Except that dancing bear mention shows the limits of Littlefinger's knowledge. Oh, prior to the feast, there was lots of anticipation of a dancing bear, 
but the actual bear Cersei acquires is small, elderly, and clumsy. It's an unimpressive attraction in the end, and not worth mentioning, and clearly Littlefinger didn't know that. And hearing about singers and jugglers isn't exactly impressive. The one aspect of the wedding that Littlefinger does seem to know about is the jousting dwarfs. And of course, the reason he knows about this is because he hired them. And we actually know that Littlefinger is telling the truth about this, as one of the jousting dwarfs, Penny, later mentions that she was hired by Littlefinger's crony, Oswell. Now, it's pretty clear that the dwarfs would lead to conflict between Tyrion and Joffrey. Either Tyrion would hate them like Joffrey wanted, or Joffrey would be angry that Tyrion didn't hate them. So we can surmise that Littlefinger did in fact want to cause some sort of conflict between Tyrion and Joffrey at the wedding. Now it's Sansa that reveals to Littlefinger that everyone thinks Tyrion poisoned Joffrey. But Littlefinger takes credit for the death and claims that he wanted Joffrey dead just to confuse everyone. So in Sansa's first exchange with Littlefinger, we really only find out that Littlefinger planned for the dwarfs to be there and to create conflict between Joffrey and Tyrion. The Bells let Littlefinger know that Joffrey died and Sansa herself told him everyone thinks Tyrion poisoned Joffrey. Now Littlefinger waits days before breaching the subject of the feast again. Sansa and Littlefinger arrive in the Fingers and sit to have a snack. Now with Littlefinger arriving at his castle, there is a possibility that news from King's Landing and details of the wedding could have been sent there, but we don't appear to have any moment of Littlefinger leaving Sansa's side to be updated. So again, unless Oswell knew something, Littlefinger should still be mostly in the dark. So Sansa asks Littlefinger if Dantos poisoned Joffrey, and Littlefinger says that Dantos was far too irresponsible. But Littlefinger does say that Dantos was tasked with making Sansa wear her hairnet. So it does appear Littlefinger did know the hairnet had poison in it. Sansa then asks if one of the Kettle Blacks poisoned Joffrey's cup. She is the one that reveals the method of how she thinks the poison was delivered. Littlefinger then asks if someone straightened her hairnet. And Sansa blurts out, you cannot mean, she wanted to take me to Highgarden to marry her grandson. Now this at first seems to be a big implication of Alina Tyrell, but again, Sansa is the one that reveals the identity. There are certainly other possibilities on what could have happened. After all, just because one adjusts a hairnet doesn't mean one is removing a stone and putting it in somebody's cup. Littlefinger could have guessed that at some point during the night, someone would have adjusted Sansa's hairnet, and that person is a good patsy. Or maybe Littlefinger actually had an agent who was supposed to adjust Sansa's hairnet later on. And he was expecting Sansa to say that person, but she instead said Alina Tyrell, so Littlefinger just ran with it. This isn't to say that Alina having her hands on that net isn't very suspicious. She remains our number one suspect. But we should remember that Littlefinger hasn't really provided very much information. He revealed that he knew that there was a hairnet with poison in it, and that there were dwarf jousters. The Bells told him who was murdered, and it was Sansa who told the method, and who she suspected of doing it. So was it actually the Queen of Thorns? Well, after Sansa reveals Olena's name, Littlefinger tells the full story, or perhaps made a bunch of stuff up. Let's examine if Littlefinger's story actually makes any sense. According to Littlefinger, he went to Highgarden praising Joffrey to get Mace Tyrell to agree to a marriage between Marjorie and Joffrey. And according to Littlefinger, he also suggested Loras join the Kingsguard. Meanwhile, he had all of his cronies pass rumors about how horrible Joffrey was. So, Olena purportedly, after realizing that Joffrey was horrible and would likely hurt Marjorie and get in a fight with Loras, decides to kill Joffrey. So, filling in some blanks, it seems that Littlefinger is claiming that he and Olena then teamed up, got some poison, gave the poison to Dantos, who in turn gave the poison to Sansa, who in turn had that poison taken from her by Olena, who then dropped that poison in Joffrey's wine. Meanwhile, some dwarfs were brought to create a dispute between Joffrey and Tyrion for... reasons. Now, there's quite a few things wrong with this story. One, why would Olena align with Littlefinger? Littlefinger was praising Joffrey and was Joffrey's master of coin, and later Joffrey makes Littlefinger Lord of Harrenhal and Lord Paramount of the Trident. By Littlefinger's own admission, he had no motive. So why on earth would Olena Tyrell think Littlefinger would be game for something like regicide? How would one even breach that subject? And what does Littlefinger even bring to the table? Why even involve him? For the poison? Is Littlefinger the only person who can get that? Olena can't just send in a cat spa and rob a maester? Two, why the strangler in wine? The poison that kills Joffrey is the strangler and is designed to make it look like someone choked. 
George R. R. Martin even specifically says that the strangler was used for that reason. Okay then, why put it in something you can't really choke on? Why put it in wine? Now I grant, when Cresson first describes this poison, he talks about dissolving it in wine. But doesn't it make more sense to dissolve it in something else? Let's say Joffrey hadn't eaten that pie right after. Wouldn't it be weird for him to choke on wine alone? And isn't the wine goblet pretty risky? I mean, Marjorie was drinking from the same cup as Joffrey. And this fact is not lost on the Tyrells. Olena's whole motive was purportedly the protection of Marjorie. Of all the cups to put poison in, why the chalice? Not to mention that thing was getting kicked around and dumped without being drunk. Three, why involve Sansa and Dantos? Why give the poison to an irresponsible drunk to pass to a 13-year-old girl? Littlefinger specifically says that Dantos is incompetent or to be trusted. What if he gets wasted and loses the hairnet? Or what if he turns Littlefinger in? Or what if Sansa loses or forgets the hairnet or decides she doesn't like it? Now one might argue that Sansa and Dantos are the backup patsies in case the choking isn't believed. And yet so much of the plan is reliant on these seemingly extraneous people. Also, if Dantos and Sansa were the backup patsies, why on earth did the jousting dwarves come in to create tension between Joffrey and Tyrion? When it comes down to it, the story Littlefinger puts forward doesn't really make sense. The plan is overly complicated. The poison goes from Littlefinger to Dantos to Sansa to Alina to the Chalice. It could easily just be Olena to the Chalice. Why involve Littlefinger, Dantos, Sansa, and some jousting dwarves? And why involve a conspiracy of people if you're just gonna have to do the killing in the end? What's one more cat's paw at this point? It's also overly dangerous. Why poison wine that could be drunk by Marjorie? And why involve people like Littlefinger and Dantos who have no reason to help you and every reason to turn you in? So the Queen of Thorns trying to kill Joffrey in the manner described by Littlefinger just doesn't seem likely. And yet, what other explanation do we have? Well, let's go back to the wedding and figure out what else could have happened. So at the feast, we know roughly where people are sitting in the throne room. To start, we know that the Tyrells and the Martells are seated as far from each other as possible. Joffrey and Marjorie are, of course, on the dais, likely in the middle, with Sir Marin and Sir Osmond standing guard. Tyrion and Sansa are on the dais, far to the right. Tyrion never describes anyone sitting further than Sansa, so I'm assuming they're on the end. Tyrion and Sansa are definitely on the Tyrell side of the hall. Anyway, I imagine that Marjorie, Mace Tyrell, Mace's wife, O'Leary Hightower, and the Queen of Thorns would be sitting closest to Joffrey. We know directly next to Tyrion is Garland Tyrell and his wife, Leonette Fossway. Tyrion says a dozen people sit closer to Joffrey, but I'm not sure if he means a dozen counting one side of Joffrey or a dozen counting both. It's not really that important, but there could be six people sitting between Leonette Fossway and the Queen of Thorns. So before the feast, the Queen of Thorns already straightened Sansa's hairnet, so the poison is either with her, or still with Sansa, or both. Now the action essentially begins when the jousting dwarfs perform, and it naturally leads to conflict between Joffrey and Tyrion. Joffrey walks down to Tyrion with his chalice, and dumps the wine on him, and drops the chalice on the floor. Then Marjorie goes down there and urges Joffrey to come back to his seat to watch some singers. And the Queen of Thorns is there too to make fun of those singers. Joffrey wants more wine though, so he orders Tyrion to pick up his cup. He then claims a flagon of wine from a servant girl and fills the cup, drinks deep, and sets it on the table. He survives. No poison. Garlin helps Tyrion back to his seat, and then the pie arrives. Marjorie and Joffrey go to cut the pie, and Sir Illyn comes out of the shadows with his new sword. The sword isn't ice, but Sansa thinks it is. Sansa goes into shock while everyone else is quite distracted by the pigeons. Then a serving man arrives with pigeon pie and covers it with lemon cream for Tyrion and Sansa. Neither eat it. Tyrion and Sansa then try to leave, but Joffrey rushes back to have Tyrion serve him wine. Marjorie tries to get Joffrey to return to their seats, but Joffrey drinks some wine, eats Tyrion's pigeon pie with lemon cream, and drinks some more wine. He then dies. So these are the six people that were in the vicinity of the wine and the pie and were capable of wrongdoing. I'd like to stress again that we don't know if Joffrey was the target and we don't know if it was the wine that was actually poisoned. After all, Joffrey ate Tyrion's pigeon pie with lemon cream around the same time. So we have Olena Tyrell, Leonette Fossaway, Garland Tyrell, Tyrion Lannister, Sansa Stark, and Server X. Of course, the first three are really the same thing. It's all Team Tyrell. Olena passing poison to Garland or Leonette, or the couple taking poison from Sansa's hairnet to poison the wine, doesn't really change anything, except make Olena's plan even more complicated. 
So for simplicity, let's just roll them into Alina. Tyrion and Sansa were of course physically capable of doing an action, but this would take some sort of Tyler Durden, Jekyll and Hyde, some conscious mind situation. Pycelle's stranger sample was missing and Tyrion technically could have stolen it. Sansa perhaps really did figure out there was poison in her hair. And now they're just lying to themselves. I can't really argue against it, but this would be something completely and utterly different beyond anything we've seen in the books so far. So I'm gonna set this option aside. We are essentially left with two possibilities. Option A, the Queen of Thorns poisoned Joffrey's wine when everyone was distracted by the pigeons. She didn't really have access to the pie. Or option B, Server X poisoned Tyrion's pie. He could have either brought in his own poison, or he could have gotten the poison from Sansa's hairnet when she was in shock from Sir Illyn's sword, or when she was distracted by the pigeons. He could then have placed the poison on top of the pie and covered it with lemon cream, where it dissolved. Joffrey dying was simply a mistake, as Tyrion was the true target. Now we've already talked about how option A doesn't make too much sense, so let's explore option B. Now, first of all, George R. R. Martin clearly wants us to wonder if the poison was in the pie or the wine. Not only does Joffrey consume them around the same time, but the Kingsguard later even debate the issue. He filled Joffrey's cup with wine. That must have been when he slipped the poison in. Are you certain it was the wine that was poisoned? What else? The imp emptied the dregs on the floor. Why but to spill the wine that might have proved him guilty? He knew the wine was poisoned. The imp was not alone on the dais. Far from it. That late in the feast, we had people standing and moving about, changing places, slipping off to the privy. Servants were coming and going. The king and queen had just opened the wedding pie. Every eye was on them or those thrice damned dubs. No one was watching the wine cup. Who else was on the dais? The king's family, the bride's family, Grand Maester Pycelle, the High Septon. So as you can see, the king's guard's piss poor logic settles on the wine being poisoned. They only think it's the wine because they believe Tyrion to be guilty. But when they move away from the possibility of Tyrion's guilt, they illogically stay focused on the wine. We should note that Sir Balon specifically says that servants were coming and going. Now one big thing that points to the pie being the source of the poison is how the poison affects Joffrey. Joffrey is not our only character to die from the Strangler. Maester Cresson does as well back in the prologue of A Clash of Kings. The wine was sour on his tongue. He let the empty cup drop from his fingers to shatter on the floor. He does have power here, my lord, the woman said, and fire cleanses. At her throat, the ruby shimmered redly. Cresson tried to reply, but his words caught in his throat. So we have an almost immediate effect on Cresson. He is unable to get a single word out. Now let's compare this to Joffrey drinking his wine. Joff yanked it from his hands and drank long and deep, his throat working as the wine ran purple down his chin. My lord, Marjorie said, we should return to our places. Lord Buckler wants to toast us. My uncle hasn't eaten his pigeon pie. Holding the chalice one-handed, Joff jammed his other into Tyrion's pie. It's ill luck not to eat the pie, he scolded as he filled his mouth with hot spiced pigeon. See, it's good, spitting out flakes of crust. He coughed and helped himself to another fistful. So while Cresson had an immediate reaction and was unable to talk after drinking his wine, Joffrey gets a line out and is then able to eat some pie before his reaction begins with that first cough. If there were an immediate reaction, it happens after eating the pie, not after drinking the wine. Now, of course, if Tyrion's pie were poisoned, this changes everything. This means that Tyrion was the target and not Joffrey. But who would want Tyrion dead? Who would hire Server X? Well, I will say that the most awesome explanation for who poisoned the pie would be Cersei. We know that she does fear Tyrion after the ashes in the mouth threat, and there is that Maggie the Frog prophecy. And the brutal thought of accidentally killing your own son is certainly dark on a George R. R. Martin level. And she does go down a road of insanity in the following book. That said, in A Feast for Crows, her thoughts do show that she thinks Tyrion killed Joffrey. This means that for her to be the killer, it would require some sort of Tyler Durden, Jekyll and Hyde, subconscious mind situation. So it's a bit of a stretch. And Cersei being the killer wouldn't explain what Littlefinger was doing with the dwarfs and the hairnet. There would have to be two murder plots going on simultaneously with the Strangler or something. While Cersei being the killer may make the best story, the evidence really points to someone more boring. Server X was simply hired by Littlefinger. Littlefinger was trying to kill Tyrion and accidentally killed Joffrey and then felt it advantageous to also blame the Tyrells. 
After all, unlike Joffrey, Littlefinger had a huge motive for killing Tyrion. Tyrion claimed he knew who killed Jon Arryn right to Littlefinger's face back in A Clash of Kings. He then made Littlefinger furious by offering him Harrenhal and a Marcella Sweet Robin marriage, only to then rescind it. And let's not forget that Tyrion knows that Littlefinger lied about the Valyrian dagger that was used to attack Bran. Not to mention, Sir Mandon Moore was put on the Kingsguard by Jon Arryn, even though he didn't like him. Meaning he was likely put there because Lysa Arryn liked him, which means he was likely a Littlefinger crony. And Sir Mandon did try to kill Tyrion at the Blackwater. But most of all, Littlefinger's plans for Sansa involve marriage, whether it be to Harry the heir or himself. He needs Sansa to be widowed. He needs Tyrion to die. Littlefinger has a huge motive for killing Tyrion, and, by his own admission, has no motive for killing Joffrey. In fact, Sansa's marital status is a huge problem with believing that Joffrey was the target. The murder was clearly intended to look like an accident, yet Cersei accuses Tyrion unexpectedly. If Joffrey were the target and people thought it was a choking, Littlefinger would be stuck with a married Sansa. He is, as it turns out, stuck with a married Sansa, but that's only because his actual plan went awry. Tyrion being the target also simply fits with everything else so much better. The jousting dwarves are there to distract Tyrion and keep him off guard. After all, Littlefinger predicted that Tyrion would hate them, and Sir Ellen's sword is there to distract Sansa so she doesn't notice anyone in her hair. And the hairnet places the poison next to the target and allows Server X to quite quickly grab the poison and place it on food rather than fumbling around in his pockets. After all, it's a bit weird that the Queen of Thorns would take poison from Sansa only to return to where Sansa is to commit murder. And in case the plan is revealed, Dantos and Server X are the fall guys. In fact, it would be astoundingly odd if the Queen of Thorns did her own murdering. Now you may ask, if the Queen of Thorns is innocent, why did she walk up to Sansa and say, the wind has been at your hair though, and then straighten her hairnet? Well, what if the wind had been at Sansa's hair? What if her hairnet was crooked? That seems a lot more likely than putting together a convoluted plan with Littlefinger that ends with her murdering a 13-year-old boy herself. And that is some food for thought regarding the Purple Wedding. Once again, I'm probably wrong about half of this. Now, I know a lot of you are probably thinking, but in the show, the Queen of Thorns did kill Joffrey. Yes, and in the show, Podrick Payne is a sex god. Needless to say, the books in the show are different. And next time, we'll continue with another murder mystery. See you then.